The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this episode are that of the guest and host and do not necessarily reflect the values of sponsors or other associated organizations. Welcome to the Parental Compass by Family Education and Support Services. I'm Bobby Williams. Glad to have you here. Please subscribe to the show. And if you're willing, leave us a review on Apple. It, it changes the algorithm somehow. So we appreciate you leaving us a review. Middle school is a very difficult time. It's this weird in-between stage. You're not quite a little kid but you're not a full-on teenager. It's an especially difficult time for navigating social relationships. Our guest today is Jessica Spear. JessicaSpear.com, look her up. Jessica has created multiple workbooks to help young people navigate the murky waters of middle school. She has a lot of good ideas for parents too. Let's check it out. And you kind of hit it on the head because, you know, within every single middle school classroom, there's somebody who is much more, you know, they're, they're developmentally much more like an, ele an elementary school kid. And there's others that are almost, you know, physically developed and, and, you know, look like high schoolers. So all in one classroom. So there's a huge amount of, you know, physical changes, social, emotional changes, intellectual changes. And that takes a toll on, you know, their relationships, of course. You know, some kids are you know, in the early years, so elementary school, where our relationships are based much on play. And then there's this shift that happens. You know, once we get to these preteen years and everybody's starting this process at a different point, relationships are based on other things, you know, so there's shared interest and acceptance and, and things like that. So all of a sudden we, we see this shakeup in kids, you know, it's totally normal. It's just part of development, but it's, it can be unsettling for the kids as well as their parents as, as they navigate, watch their kids navigate this. It's like they're kind of finding their identity for the yes. first time. Exactly. And they're testing things out, you know, so we see some kids, you know, they might have blue hair or they might decide to dress a totally different way. So they they are really tar starting to explore who am I, you know, and, and where do I fit, you know, so so there's lots of changes going on. And, you know, which is why it can be uncomfortable, because, you know, sometimes a lot of changes at once can be uncomfortable. Well, and there's the concept of popularity. And what does it even mean to be popular now? Yes. Yes. And it's really, it's, well, and it's funny you mentioned that because I have a whole chapter on just that, because as parents, you start to notice, you know, maybe an upper elementary where this word starts to appear, the popular group, or, you know, she's popular. So what's going on there is a little more complicated than that. And so I'd like to unpack that for kids. So they use this term, you know, you know, across the board for kids that they, they assume are popular, but there's different things there. Some kids, you know, fall into, you know, what research finds is more well-liked kids. You know, so these are the kids that cooperate. They're, you know, they're, they're kind, they lead in a way that's inclusive, and then there's status popularity and status popularity is a little more aggressive. Um, no, there's, there's notoriety there. So they might, you know, be more outwardly visible or want to be visible. There's power there. And so everybody gets lumped into that, you know, whether you're kind of the well-liked popularity or the status, you know, kids always talk about both those groups as popular. Um, but what I like to make sure kids understand is, you know, there's some differences there. And what do you, you know, which, which of these, you know, people do you aspire to be like, you know, so I think we can all cultivate that, you know, this, the side of popularity, they're popular because people genuinely want to be around them. Um, so th I'd like to talk to kids about that because in middle school, that status popularity peaks and then it starts to fade away. And by the end of high school, you know, everybody's over it. <laughs> you know, so so it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch that, you know, from the outside to see that transition happen. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated for kids to navigate because whether they're into a popularity or not, you know, everybody's navigating, you know, status and groups in middle school. There's, it's, it's hard to avoid. It's interesting as an adult, it's like, I never think about being popular, or what that yeah. means or... 
Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It, it kind of peaks in the middle school years, and you know, and it makes sense. And you know, you know, everybody wants to be seen and known. And this is a point in kids' lives where they are starting to pull away from their parents, which is totally, you know, appropriate developmentally. Well, and everyone just wants to be liked. Like that's a basic human thing. Uh, yeah. In your in your book, you talk about the friendship pyramid. So, what is this pyramid? So the friendship pyramid does a picture in your head, just you know, the shape of a pyramid, a triangle at the tippy top, you know, we have our close friends. And what I like to talk to preteens and teens about is, you know, these friendships are a little more rare, you know, as we know, as adults, you know, we, you know, we can count our close friends typically on one hand, you know, we might have just a few of these people and there's a real special connection there usually takes time to develop that and there's trust. Um, and then underneath that, you know, the majority of the pyramid I put under friends. And I'm really liberal with that term because now we have online friends and, you know, neighbors and even like cousins so and classmates. So I want kids to realize that, you know, yes, it is hard sometimes to find those really close friends, especially in middle school, because there's so many changes. But there's always people out there in that friend group, you know, who, who lives next door, who's in your class. And then underneath that is acquaintances, you know, so all the people we don't know well, but are possible friends. And, and the reason I like to share this is because you know, there, there's a lot of changes in middle school. There was a study done out of UCLA that showed that the first year of middle school, two thirds of friendships change. You know, it's, it's a time of huge change. So that can feel unsettling to kids. Like, wait, what's happening here? You know, who are my friends? So just knowing that, you know, someone can go from a close friend down the pyramid to an acquaintance, or sometimes from an acquaintance all the way up to a close friend. So that's, you know, one of my friendship truths is, Friendships have different phases and change over time. So when kids know that, they're like, oh, it's not me. This is just how it works. You know, this is kind of how social relationships work. They're always filled with transitions and change. Yeah, and throughout your whole life too, yeah. it's like friendships sort of ebb and flow and change or you move somewhere or something happens. And so it's good to start learning that. How can a young person tell if a friendship is a good friendship? You know, and I, I encourage kids to notice you know, how they feel when they're with this friend. So the, the words I use is these are the friendships that feel safe and accepting and, and safe as far as emotional safety. So these are the friends that we can really tell what we're feeling and what we're thinking. You know, so those thoughts and emotions that we might not feel comfortable sharing with everybody because there hasn't been that trust developed yet in that relationship. So, so yeah, so the words I use are, you know, our closest friends, those friendships feel safe and accepting. But again, you know, in middle school, these can be hard to find. So, so just, you know, just helping kids know that, you know, just to keep their eye out for those relationships that do feel safe and accepting. And, and this is a great stage of life for kids to start to notice that because that's a really important quality later in romantic relationships, you know, so safe and accepting. So I, I love those words to describe those relationships that really are the ones that are our, our, our support system. You know, you know, it's important for everybody, you know, to, at some point to have those relationships that are their go-to people that they have that, that feeling, that sense of safety and acceptance. Well, and what you're saying is kind of about just learning to trust your body too. Yes. Of if you're not sure about a situation, how does your body feel about it? And that is a good just like compass inside of you. What about if a child has a friend that isn't treating them the way they want to be treated? What's the course of action there? Yeah, and this is a tough one for kids because I found, and especially for girls, so speaking up when they're not being treated well is scary is scary for kids and and for many reasons you know one might be groups are so intertwined you know so they're afraid to speak up because they're not sure the ripple effect you know through their whole friendship group and you know these are young people so sometimes you know, when you give somebody feedback it just doesn't land well you know so 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 they're afraid of what might happen but i encourage kids you know if they if they feel comfortable to speak up but to speak up in a way that connects 
rather than divides. So I talk to kids, you know, and starting in elementary school about those I statements, you know, instead of you never include me, you know, I feel really left out when that happens, you know, and just, you know, letting them know, you know, that, that just starting the conversation that way is, is going to have, you know, a better impact than if we start kind of with blame and criticism, you know, but this is a long process. I mean, let's face it, adults, struggle with this too, right? This is hard. So, you know, I give kids lots of room to figure out how they want to navigate that. And, you know, might start with, you know, well, what are your choices here? You know, let's talk about this situation. This friend isn't treating you really well. What are your choices here? And let them think that through. You know, they can do A, they can do B, or they can do C, and then they choose, you know, because just that process, the process of them Figuring out their options, deciding, that's building confidence in their own problem solving skills right there. So I, it is important for us as parents and caregivers to take a step back and encourage them to, to you know, think about their choices um, and, and take the lead there because they are building confidence. Well, and that's empowering too. You can navigate your own life and decide what you want to do with any given circumstance. Yes. And they know, and, and these situations tend to be really complex, you know, and we as adults, we don't get it. You know, we, we don't get the complexity of the situation and we don't know the whole story. So, so yeah. we do, it, it's almost inappropriate for us to jump in there with our advice because we don't get it, you know? So, so just, you know, encouraging them to think it through, you know, how do they want to be? How do they want to act in this situation? You know, what are their values and encourage them to, to give it a try, you know, just to practice. Well, and what you're saying is very counter to, I think, how a lot of parents feel in that as a parent, you want to fix the situation or you want to give advice and that might not help in this circumstance, it sounds like. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I've been doing this for a while and I still do that sometimes. I have to catch myself. I just want to jump right in. Well, what about this? You know, so it's really hard. So what I'm practicing and I'm still working on this is just pausing and listening and validating and being curious. You know, I think what I've found works best is if I can stay really grounded, if I cannot have an emotional reaction to their emotions, you know, they know that I am a safe place for them to come through. I'm not, I'm not going to jump in and try to fix it. I'm not going to go off on my very own emotional roller coaster. So I then, you know, become the safe space where they know they can come and talk to me and I'm not going to, you know, get overly involved. With this generation, they're very down to just call something out as toxic. Like they have a conflict with a friend and it's like, oh, that person's toxic. I'm never talking to them again. They're, they're cut off from my life. And it's like, whatever happened to just working things out with people? Like I've had conflicts with friends where I've been very mad and we've talked about it and then we're still friends on the other side. It seems like that's a skill that's being lost a little. Yeah, and what I see happening is that's a, a complete reflection of what's happening in society right now, you know, isn't it? Like that's that's how we are operating, you know, as humans right now. And, and it is unfortunate because I think we have lost the ability to find empathy and leave some room for repair there. We, so I agree with you 100%. And, you know, the only thing I could think of to do in this regard where, you know, we as parents have some say is to really watch what we're saying, you know, in, in our interactions, you know, we're modeling all the time for our kids. So if we are not labeling people, you know, not using those inflammatory terms to describe people, talking more about, you know, these social skills as skills that people are learning and people make mistakes, you know, so if, if it's, you know, that's the best we can do to guide our kids is for us to be as open and cautious with how we are dealing with people. Yeah, so uh, that's that's a, that's a hard answer, but I, I do think kids are just doing exactly what they're seeing online and in media and in conversations in real life. They're, they're just following suit. I think I may have read this on your website, but there was some quote where it's like, everyone is doing the best they can with the skills they have. And yeah. different kids are at different maturity levels. Everyone's had different experiences. It's so hard to not take things personal especially when they feel personal, like even if someone is coming at me in some type of way I don't like, 
it may not be about me. It might be about whatever they're dealing with in their life. And that's something I'm still working on. And I think a lot of us have to work on still, but for middle schoolers, that seems really difficult to just not um, take things personally. It, yeah, it is because they, they're in a vulnerable point in time and, you know, confidence dips for preteens and teens, you know, especially in those those middle school years, you know, their confidence is dipping. So, of course, if they hear something somebody's saying about the land that's really mean, of course, it hurts. I mean, at any age, that yeah. hurts. So, um, you know, the only way to deal with that is honor that emotion and experience it and let it flow through you and, you know, do what you can to get, you know, to get through that. Um, so yeah, it's, it is a hard time. And, and it's funny you mentioned, you know, don't take things personally. It's not about you. That's, that's a theme I come back to, you know, especially in my book about middle schools. Cause I think we just have to keep reminding ourselves and, you know, helping our kids remember there's a lot more to this story, you know? So the person is probably behaving like this for some reason that we do not understand, you know? And sometimes I've, I've, I've learned some things about people later that I wish I'd known, you know, when they were, you know, behaving, whatever, whatever unsavory behavior was happening and I'm reacting to that. And then I later learned some tragedy that they have at home or something really, I'm like, oh, I wish I'd known that then, you know, because that that would have made that situation a lot less difficult. I get it now. I get why this this person is behaving this way. So it is hard. It's a lifelong journey. You know, it's a lifelong journey because we are human and we do feel things. And in the preteen years and teen years, we feel things really deeply. What about when your child is just lonely? They don't have a lot of friends. It's Saturday and there's no one to hang out with. That yeah. seems so hard. It's super hard. And I know it's hard for parents to watch that, you know, because we worry, you know, friends are really important, you know, especially at this age in life. So, so something parents can do behind the scenes is see what they can do to connect their kids in activities, you know, that they're really inspired by. And there are always some kids that they don't find their connections at school. I wish I could say they did, but I know a lot of kids that they didn't find their people at their school. So they found their people maybe in outside activities or maybe at a summer camp or, you know, so we have to stay open to that. And as parents, we help with those connections, you know, because they don't have to be at school. There's there's nothing that says that they have to have these close friends at school, but, you know, they're, they're more likely to meet these friends doing the activities that they really like to do, because in those years, relationships do tend to be based on shared interests. So, you know, think about what what's interesting to your kid. Can you get them involved in something where they're likely to meet some similar kids? This is really interesting. A great conversation. I wish we had more time to talk. Do you have any parting words for us? Ooh, parting words. I think, you know, more than anything, I just encourage parents to keep just loving their kids for exactly who they are and keep working on, just like I'm trying to do it myself, keep working on just being that safe space for them to come to, you know, you're, you're, we're their emotional coaches, you know, we're their cheerleaders, we're their support system. Just keep working on that because, you know, it's, if we can keep that connection close at home, that's going to help them navigate the inevitable bumps in their social world. Thanks for being here, Jessica. Thanks for having me, Balby. It's great to meet you. Thank you, Jessica Spear. Get her books on Amazon. Go to jessicaspear.com. It was great having you on. This has been the Parental Compass by Family Education and Support Services. I'm Bobby Williams. We'll see you next week. Peace.